Right. Very good. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to the Center for Theoretical and Computational Physics weekly seminar. And today it is a pleasure to welcome Alvaro Marin from the University of Twente in Enschede, the Netherlands. Alvaro is originally from Sevilla, where he did both his first degree and his PhD. He then moved to Enschede in the Netherlands, where he did a, a first postdoc then on to another postdoc in Germany, and then back to Enschede as a staff member where he's been since and has been funded by an ERC um, uh, grant. And this is the work that he's kindly agreed to tell us about today on evaporating droplets. Before I hand over to Alvaro, I have a few announcements to make. First, this seminar is being recorded, so by staying on, you're giving permission for your voice and uh, image to be uh, recorded and stored. And second, in the interests of internet stability, can I please ask you to mute your microphones, microphones and turn off your cameras during the seminar. If you wish to ask a question, then you can, of course, unmute yourself and, if you so desire, turn on your camera. And now, enough from me, it's over to Alvin. Thanks, Paolo, and thanks everyone for, for inviting me, for, for giving a talk there, uh, here online. Um, as, I, as Paolo said, I mean, I'm originally from Sevilla, although I've been many, many years away from, from there, but um, I, I, I really enjoy my trips to Lisbon, which I did, which I visited quite often. And uh, I hope after the pandemic, we're able, I, I will be able to visit you again there. Um, it's also a pleasure. I mean, I saw the lineup of the of the next speakers that you have in the in your seminar. I saw that there are a bunch of of Dutch speakers, so I'm I'm happy to be a part of the of the gang of the, the gang of speakers that you're going to have. So so it's a pleasure to to join you here. Let me share my screen. So I'm going to be talking today about. Um, I will give you a summary of some of the stuff that I've been doing uh, involving the transport of particles, especially colloids, uh, inside evaporating droplets. And I'm going to tell you basically the conclusion that I'm going to, to convey you is that um, we there are only very few cases in which we know where the particles will end up in an evaporating droplet. And, and this has a lot of consequences for a lot of uh, systems that we not only that have industrial uh, interests or practical interests, but also in our daily life. So um, basically, the, the basic idea is, or the basic system that I'm going to be talking about uh, is, imagine that you have a bunch of colloids which are randomly distributed in, a, not in, the, in a free space, but they will be distributed in a confined space. And what I'm going to show you is that by different mechanisms, um, these particles will, in some circumstances, will end up typically at the border of that confined volume that, that, uh, in which they are in. And um, I will show you two or three cases in which, we, which I can tell you that it always happens. So maybe the most famous case um, is a case of the coffee stains, uh, the coffee stain effect. Um, this is what happens just in a line, I mean, uh, in a sentence. Um, this is what happens when you have a droplet of a suspension, which can be coffee, for example, and you have it on your on your on your table, and then when the droplet evaporates, all the content, the non-volatile content of that droplet, ends up at the rim of the of the droplet, um, which we also call contact line. Yeah. So this was this mechanism. I mean, this phenomenon occurs since always, um, but it was beautifully explained by, by Robert Deegan and, and, and his team leaded, uh, led by uh, Thomas Witten. And uh, the name of Thomas Witten will show up again in this talk. Um, and they explain in a really beautiful, um, with a very nicely and simple mathematical description. And it's, it, this was in 1997, in, in, in 2017, uh, celebrated the 20 years of the paper. And uh, the impact of this of this work has been huge, and it's still it's still going on. If you if you count the number of citations over the years, it's still increasing, and it's still increasing because what it started as a interesting uh, model, uh, mostly interested for physicists, it reached out to chemists, to chemical engineers, and to a lot of different disciplines, biologists, 
So the boom of this of this effect and why why the coffee uh, stain effect became so popular is because I mean it it's, it really impact across disciplines. So um, I can let me explain you a little bit more in detail what is this about. So um, imagine we have a droplet uh, in a partially wetting uh, substrate. Um, this uh, droplet is, we have a liquid like water that is evaporating gently, not, not very strongly. This evaporation is diffusion limited. So basically all the, all the vapor that is uh, created over here is saturated and it diffuses uh, freely uh, to the infinity. And then uh, another really important uh, fact is the following. So if, if this droplet is free to move uh, around, um, when it evaporates, the next in the next instance, the droplet will have a profile like this, right? If it's free to move, I mean, basically, it will be able to move in the towards this direction because the the rim of the droplet, the contact line, which uh, I'm going to call the contact line, the rim, the perimeter of the droplet, will be free to move. So this is what typically would a droplet would do, right? Now. Typically, the coffee stain effect only happens when we have the contact line pinned, and that's the most important effect. This means that the contact line, because of some obstacles or because of some defects that are in the substrate, um, this contact line is not free to move. It will be retained there. This means that actually the, the interface will have to do something like, rather like this, right? And um, and it has to do that because, I mean, it needs to keep a constant curvature, right? We have surface tension, which is dominating the, uh, the, the shape of this interface. And, um, and to be able to comply with having a constant curvature and the uh, pin contact line, it will need to go to that uh, evaporate and the next profile will be like that. That means that we have an excess of volume compared to the other case over here and a defect, so I mean, a lack of volume over here, right? And um, the way to compensate for that changes of volume, that means that, I mean, we need volume over here and we have too much volume over, over here. And the only way to compensate for that is to send liquid towards the contact line, towards the rim. So that's basically the essence of the coffee stain effect. It's a matter, it's a matter of pin contact line, uh, diffusion limited evaporation, um, capillarity because we need a we need the shape needs to be dominated by by capillarity and mass conservation. Only that that's the only elements that we need. And with this simple simple idea, actually, it, you can reproduce this um, always this uh, this thing, and it follows a really nice uh, analytical mathematical model. Um, I was when I started to work on this, I was really fascinated by this. Um, uh, problem, and um, I'm going to show you one of the first experiments that I did, which which shows something that on the way these particles are actually packed uh, packed here in at the contact line, and um, so I can show you also live how how this goes. So I'm going to be looking at this. This is the side view of the droplet that I'm going to be looking at. Um, this is just a reflection on a, it's a droplet of water on a glass slide. From now on, I'm, I'm always going to be using water as a, as a working liquid. And the particles that I'm going to be using is going to be um, polystyrene particles of one micron, typically a one micron size, maybe in some situations uh, a little bit larger or, or, or smaller, but always colloidal or brownian size. And these particles are typically coated, functionalized with sulfate groups that makes them, gives them a little bit of, of negative uh, surface charge that prevents them to come too close to each other. I'm not going to use any other uh, stabilization mechanism in the droplet uh, unless I tell you so. So I'm not using surfactant, I'm not using any extra salt. So the particles repel each other a little bit uh, electrostatically. Yeah? But the range of that interaction is short enough such that it doesn't matter so much. So um, I'm going to be looking at the same time to this droplet from the side and also from the bottom. Whoop, that went too fast. And also from the bottom. So, um, let's see. Now I'll explain. So, right. So this is what you will see from the bottom in, on a microscope looking at this area over here. So you see all the particles 
doing, experiencing Brownian motion, just, just not doing anything by passing around. And I'm going to be plotting here, then doing some PAV analysis here. And I'm plotting here the component of the velocity, the radial component of the velocity. So basically the component of the velocity that goes into, into this direction, yeah? direction towards the, towards the contact line. So you see over here, I mean, there's not much going on. Uh, it's just basically Brownian motion. So the average UR component of the, of the velocity that I'm plotting here is basically essentially zero. Nothing, nothing special is going on uh, at this point. Um, but if, I, I, if, if we go a little bit longer, I mean, this typically takes like 15, 20 minutes. Um, you start to see that the, 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 the velocity starts to increase. And that was something that was not very obvious um, from the model of Deegan. And um, I'm going to continue playing from this point, and you can see that it's not only is increasing moderately, it's increasing dramatically, actually exponentially, up to the point that in the moment that the, the dropper evaporates completely, it looks like it's, uh, the velocity actually is following kind of a singularity uh, towards infinity, yeah? um, reaching the particles reach really, really large velocities. Um, this has crucial consequences on how the particles are actually aggregating at the contact line. Um, because in the first instance, when the velocity, the convective velocity that is dragging the particles towards the contact line is, is very slow, we actually, the particles aggregate in a very organized and orderly way. Um, and as, as, I, as I show you in the video, the velocity actually increases exponentially. And there is a point at which actually the arrangement of the particles is completely disorganized and, and random. And this happens at a very precise time, or rather to say a very precise value of the convective velocity. And in this work that I'm showing you there, uh, we found out that actually is, you can think about it in a very simple way. Um, just, it's a matter of, of time scales. This change from order packing to disorder packing in the, in the particles occurs when the uh, typical time scale of the convective flow is comparable to the typical, um, to a typical diffusive time scale of the particles, but rather um, not the typical time that the particle takes to diffuse around, but um, basically the time that a particle takes to encounter another particle by, by Brownian motion. And we found out that this, this velocity, critical velocity scales well with the, with the average um, distance between the particles, the diffusion, the diffusion, Brownian diffusivity constant of the particles and their size. And we confirmed that actually not um, uh, for particles um, that were typically in the colloidal range down to a few decades of nanometers. Below, when the particles become too small, the interactions, the van der Waals interaction between them and other interactions become too strong. And then they dominate the way they aggregate. But as long as they are in this uh, hundred, from hundred, a few hundred nanometers up to a few microns, this, this ordering uh, uh, is valid. And this way we could prove in these papers, which are now ancient. Um, something really interesting that we also, we, that we also notice is that, um, the, part the particles that are nicely arranged, this is a, a, a scanning electron uh, microscope image of, a, of one of these stains focusing in this, in this range. There is not so much of the disorder because I mean, there, there was not in this particular experiment, there were not so many particles in the system. But you see something, I hope you see something interesting here. You see that there, the, there are particles here arranged as with an hexagonal packing. Then we continue a little bit forward, and then you see that actually here they're arranging in a, in a square kind of packing. Then they go back to, to hexagonal. And then, well, then it becomes a bit messy, but mostly mostly hexagonal again and all that. So we were quite puzzled by that until, until we found out that actually this type of changes in, in different packing, for, and, uh, packing uh, mechanism has been actually uh, experienced before by, by Pavel Piransky in Paris. And he observed it also with colloids, um, but he didn't do it with a, with a droplet. He did just put in a sphere, confining the system of a, of a sphere or with a flat plane. This means that the particles that you have here, they will have um, different access. This, the height of this uh, will be changing allowing different types of packing, depending on how much um, um, depth or height 
are they are they available? How, do they have available? And he also saw and he saw exactly the same phenomenon: changes of or from from hexagonal packing to a square type of packing, depending on the on the uh, level of confinement in the axial direction. So from uh, having this square packing, hexagonal packing, depending on the distance from the center of that sphere. Inter interestingly, in our case, it is the droplet interface uh, which makes that confinement, which makes that wedge and uh, uh, shows that. Um, in our case, because it also the interface, the confinement is changing in time, we didn't have so many transitions as uh, Spiransky at all saw, um, but it, it was any, anyway interesting to see that it's exactly the same phenomenon with similar type of particles also. So, all right, so as I told you, um, to have this coffee stain effect, um, which is again, I mean, as you see, especially now with this, uh, it's a three-dimensional um, type of deposition, right? I mean, the particles are, are occupying the whole volume on the wedge because the flow goes from the, from the bulk into the contact line. We need a pin contact line. We need also diffusion limited evaporation. It will, it will have it dominated by convection, or if the diffusion will be, the evaporation will be stronger, then, then the whole process will be different. And then also important, um, two mechanisms that are two conditions that are related. I haven't talked about temperature, but we need this model works only if we have thermal equilibrium or approximately thermal equilibrium. And when we have an uniform surface, uniform surface tension along the interface. Um, and these two points are actually connected, the thermal equilibrium and the uniform. Um, and I will talk a little bit now about these two conditions. Okay? Um, so I will start with the thermal uh, effects because I mean, it's connected to the, to the surface tension along the interface. Um, in principle, I mean, for a droplet to evaporate, we need to suminister uh, some energy, right? Because I mean, the the this um, phase transition, uh, of course, uh, expense of some latent heat that needs to be consumed. So all this heat, typically, normally, I mean, it could come from the environment, but I mean, it's a gas phase, and and since we have typically, I mean, these uh, droplets are on a solid substrate. Normally, this solid substrate has a higher conductivity than the, than the liquid phase, not always, but, but in the cases that I'm going to be talking about, that's the case. This means that most of the energy comes from the, from the solid substrate. This means also that, that typically there will be a, a typically warmer area here in the closer to the, closer to the substrate. And the rest of the volume, it will be slightly a little bit colder because of the energy that is being consumed. Uh, during the evaporation. And that, that means that um, in practical conditions, I mean, there will be an area here close to the contact line, which will be with higher temperature than the area close to the zenith of the droplet, which will be a, of lower temperature. And that's have important consequences because um, if we have a change, uh, a temperature gradient, along the interface, that means that we have a, um, a gradient towards, towards the contact line. That also involves a change in surface tension. Surface tension is dependent on temperature and typically decreases um, as the temperature increases. This means that we, we will have an increase of surface tension as we go along the interface towards the, the, um, the zenith of the droplet. And if we have a gradient of surface tension, we know that we'll have also a stress along the interface, which is called the Marangoni stresses. This means that we will have actually a force being generated here toward in this in this particular case in, in that direction, um, which depending on the value can actually change also the whole profile that I have here. Yeah. So um, in order to observe this type of thermal induced thermally induced Marangoni stresses we need to have a different technique to observe the, the liquid because I mean, what I showed you before, these experiments that I showed you before, I was looking at a, at a plane, only a plane very close to the contact line. But it was a single plane for the type of evaporation. But now this is going on in a volumetric, in a volume, right? Um, with an interface that is actually changing in time. So I need to find a technique that allows me to observe the, the, the whole droplet in, in 3D. 
and it's a really tiny droplet. So, I mean, it's really difficult to have access to the whole volume. Uh, luckily, um, my colleagues uh, in Germany have a very developed a very a very nice technique in which, with only one single camera and one single point of view with a microscope, we can actually track the, the particles in, in in three dimensions. And I'm going to spend just one slide, just a couple of minutes to explain you what is this. This technique has been developed by Massimiliano Rossi and Rune Banco. And here you have a few um, uh, recent, very recent papers in which uh, they they improve the technique that we have been using in the last years. Also a recent review in which Massimiliano and I um, review how to use it for, for this type of, of, of systems, of evaporating droplets. The idea is very simple. So imagine that we have, um, here we have our, our objective, microscope objective, and, and we are observing a colloidal particle that is sitting on the bottom of my volume, uh, and it's not moving. You know, imagine that it's in solid contact, it's making solid contact with the solid substrate. It's not moving at all. And I, need, I needed to do, do it like that because I'm, what I'm going to do is change the position of the objective, change the distance uh, to see uh, to the particle, and see how the image of the particle changes as I move from the defocus point from to the focal point and again, far away from it, okay? So while I do that, the particle image will change a lot, yeah? And in most optical systems, in most microscopes, actually these uh, images are actually um, non-symmetrical respect to the focal point. So with this, I build up basically what I call my calibration images is basically a, um, a lookup table. So I know how, um, my uh, a particle will look like at different distances from the from the objective. Now, if I go to my to my experiment, I will typically have a, a lot of particles distributed along the volume. This means that at a lot of different distances from the objective. And remember that um, I mean uh, this will be, for example, my x axis. This will be my z axis, and uh, this will be y x. So I mean. X, X and Y are easy to ob obtain from my images. I just need the set uh, component of the particle position. This is in the, the position of the particle in the, in the optical axis. So to get that, that set position, what I'm going to do is select particle by particle in my, in my volume. And then I'm going to compare it with, the, with my lookup table, with my set of calibration images. I do this by performing a cross correlation with all the images in my lookup table. So I made a cross correlation between them. And then I, I can just plot it and, and then I can find which of the of the positions over here in this in this lookup table fit better, uh, give me a better cross correlation. And the best one, that will be the, the, pos the set position that I, that I choose. It's, it's a very powerful technique because it doesn't require any, any special uh, hardware. You just need to have decent illumination and a decent camera such that you have enough resolution of your particle image, which you can obtain with almost any, any fluorescent microscope setup. Okay, so we use this technique a lot. And um, I'm going to show you, for example, uh, what do we see when we look at the at the at system, which is not in, a, in thermal equili in, in equilibrium. Basically, this idea that you generate an interfacial flow. So um, this is these are a couple of a few experiments that I'm going to show you. you relative humidity, 33%, room temperature, and this particle is a little bit bigger, two microns, but it's still colloidal. What you see here is a projection in uh, in draw and set. It's a, I mean, I typically see a volume, and then I'm projecting everything into radial, uh, into well, basically polar components, no radial uh, uh, cylindrical components, no radial and set. So, and then I can also, with a side view, I can also detect my interface and I'm plotting it here. There is always some error between the um, typically one particle email, one particle size error in the position of the interface. So if you see particles out, it's not that they're in the gas phase, it's just there is some error in the position of the interface. So unfortunately with this technique, we don't know the precise position of the particle relative to the interface. But we know, that, as you can see, we, can, uh, we know very well um, in the, how are they moving? And you see very clearly how the particles, as they reach the interface, they typically climb up the interface following this type of, of Marangoni, Marangoni stress that I, that I mentioned before. So this is just water at room temperature. 
Um, typically, you see that it's going really, I mean, also lower humidity, it goes a bit faster, but particles tend to go because of the coffee stain effect, then absorb at the interface or absorb or get close to the interface and then start to climb up. Uh, CA is a contact angle value that, that they're showing you there. This means um, a few things that I, we can tell, I can I want to tell you now after seeing this. This means that I mean when, whenever we have uh, any type of mangonic stress at the interface, it doesn't matter if it's in one direction or another. This means that that will have a flow profile that is a little bit more complicated than a, than what I show you with the coffee stain effect. And the coffee stain effect will typically have only one component. The flow will be in unidirectional towards the contact line. Now, whenever I have a marangoni stress, I have another component into this direction. It can be either like this or like that, depending on the direction of the marangoni stresses. This means that a particle that is um, following here, for example, this particle over here, where actually is the streamlines that this particle will follow is actually a closed streamline. And that's important because I mean this means that during the whole evaporation process, this particle, this particle, for example, that is following this streamline, will be just recirculating uh, during the evaporation process. Of course, the streamline will will change uh, with the interface. Maybe it will shrink, but it will basically just be recirculating around. And um, the question is, where does this particle end up if it's just recirculating? And this is a Crucial difference with the classical uh, system dominated by coffee stain, in which the streamlines are not closed, are open, and they all end at the contact line. So in the classical coffee stain effect, I know that all my particles will end up at the contact line because all streamlines and streamlines end at the contact line. The moment that I have some, some stresses at the interface, um, Typically, if they, typically they will change the streamline, the shape of my streamlines, and then I don't know anymore where my particles end up. In that case, how the particle will end up will depend on how this particle, um, the interaction of the particle with the substrate, or with the interface, or with other particles that might encounter that might encounter in the way. So everything becomes much complicated, and this one becomes uncertain. And as I showed you before, there are really few cases. Um, in which we can have um, a total free interface and without stresses. So not, not many cases in which, in which that occurs. There is, I'm going to show you now uh, a case in which, a situation in which we, we can still have Marangoni stresses at the interface, actually a flow which is dominated by these stresses, but still we have, we, we know for sure where the particles will, will end up. And this was, this was a work uh, inspired actually partially by an artist called Maris Meekers that is based in the Netherlands, in, 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 in Leiden. No, sorry, in Den Haag. And um, Maurice is a photographer. And in the last years, he's been taking samples of tears from friends, colleagues, donators, uh, volunteers. And um, he managed to reproduce in his, in his studio uh, a, a microscope in which he can do micrographs of the dry patterns left, left by the tears. And tears are interesting because, I mean, they, they contain a lot, a huge amount of salt and uh, some amount of proteins and a tiny amount of surfactants, but not many. So it's basically salt and proteins. Proteins um, typically they take the form of micromolecules, so basically almost, almost colloidal particles. And then the rest of, of the things that you see in the in the stains that that of, of Maurice. I mean, and he makes these beautiful micrographs with a huge variety of, of patterns depending on depending on the donor. And even from the same donor, you will have completely different patterns depending on the different times of the day. Um, we also recently investigated, uh, still unpublished, but we recently investigated doing fractal analysis, see if we could uh, determine who's whose tier is, is uh, depending on the shape that we see in the pattern. And it's absolutely impossible. But that was a, a different fun project that I will take another day. So um, everything is, uh, the patterns look completely different from each other, as you can see. But every pattern, they have something in common. And it's the rim. In every single of the images of, of, of the micrograph of Maurice, there was always this thick rim 
apart from the amount of salt crystals and nucleate, there's always this thick rim, which we know from uh, other research in the literature that it's basically contained made of proteins, these, you know, basically colloidal micromolecules that end up at the contact line. And we also know that, that from, from research in the literature, that there are almost no other no proteins in, in the volume of the droplet, they're mostly all in the rim. So immediately we thought, okay, I mean, is this caused by a coffee stain effect uh, or something like that? I mean, which is strange because I mean, there's, there's a lot of stuff in this droplet, right? So um, I wanted to see what's, what's going on there, if it's a coffee stain or not. And instead of having a tear, which is very difficult to investigate, and since we know, from the literature that, the, that these droplets are very, had a very high content of salt. Uh, I decided to make a synthetic tear, which is basically a droplet of water with my polystyrene colloids and, uh, and different concentrations of salt. I didn't add any surfactant, I didn't add any, any type of protein. So just to have a clean uh, control system. And I used the three-dimensional technique that I, that, I, that I was describing before. And what, what I get is that the following videos, I mean, I, it's the same uh, scheme that I showed you before, where I have this, the radial distance, and you see the flow is actually completely inverse as a classical coffee stain effect. The particles in the bulk actually are going out, away from the contact line, and they only approach to the contact line along the interface. Actually, some of them you see that they are kind of trapped at the interface, and then they, they, they end up at the, at the contact line only following the interface. And the more salt I include into my system, the faster is the process. You know? So um, that was really, really a surprise because that clearly, that's clearly nothing, it's not the coffee stain effect, it's something completely different. Um, slowly we learn that actually salt actually is able to increase the surface tension of, of water solutions. The same as, as, as surfactants or, or organic apolar molecules typically decreases. With ions, you actually increase slightly the, the, the surface tension of, of a solution. It's just that it does it increases very mildly. So to be sure that that it was this was something related with the with the marangoni stress caused by by salt. With, uh, together with Stefan Kapiska, we did um, uh, some finite element simulations in which we included, uh, we included uh, salt. We know how much increases depending on the concentration. And uh, these, simul these fairly simple simulations actually represent exactly the type of the structure of the flow that we have seen in the experiments with a huge concentration of salt at the contact line and decreasing as we go away from it and creating these close streamlines that I mentioned that I mentioned before. So confirming basically what we see, what we see in the, in the experiments. And here's something interesting. We were talking about what the particles will do. So as I told you, I mean, a particle that is in principle over here will just recirculate and who know, God knows will, will, uh, where will this particle end up. But the thing is that this interface is receding, is going down, and eventually this particle will end up will end up at the interface. And there is, I told you that the, all the streamlines are closed. That's not true. There is one streamline that is not closed. It's the streamline that goes along the interface. That streamline is the only one that ends up exactly at the, at the contact line. So that means that all the particles that will en end up at the interface will have a typical, uh, will follow a stream, the, the streamline, the train that, that leads them to the contact line. Um, which is interesting because this means that this is a completely different mechanism of forming a ring-shaped stain. It's completely dominated by, by solutal marangoni stresses and, and the accumulation of particles occurs along the interface, not through the bulk as happens in the coffee stain effect. And to confirm that, we, we we went to a different type of system, optical system. It's a confocal microscope. And in a confocal microscope, we can have much better definition of where the interface is. I told you that there we had some issues where we're determining where the interface was. With the confocal, we, we can determine where the interface is much more clearly. And we can have also much better definition on, on, on the particles. 
So um, with a confocal microscope, we observe how oh, this didn't work. Uh, let me show you this one second. Um, how the particles are actually aggregating there. And the interesting thing is that what we saw is that it, it basically forms a monolayer of, of particles. You see them there, the particles in green in the video. And um, you see that all the particles that are aggregated there are basically coming along the interface and start to build a, basically a monolayer or a film that grows along the interface uh, towards the center of the droplet. No, so, so that was a, we were really, really impressed to see how nicely that monolayer is built and how it grows in time. So using this technique, we were able to, to, to image and, and measure particle by particle how these films are formed. Here you have some Voronoi analysis where, where the color is basically the, boron, the area of the, of the Voronoi cell. As we increase the salt, the patterns start to change a little bit. Between five millimolar and 10 millimolar of salt, not much change, but we believe we saw kind of a transition when we go to around 50 millimolar. You see that the particles are actually aggregated in a much more disordered way. Um, here, I mean, the pretty, pretty nicely arranged hexagonal packing, some more defects as we increase the salt concentration. And we see a change to a completely dramatic, uh, convoluted, very messy uh, patterns as, as we increase the salt concentration. And we can also see that how the, this interface or these films are growing in, in time with this technique, right? And we see that we can see around in, in several particle diameters how, how this grows. And when I saw this, you know, I'm a, I'm a physicist by, by training. I immediately remember the things that I have learned in the past on, uh, on diffusion limited aggregation, actually a model developed by Thomas Witten and Sander in the early 80s. Um, Thomas Witten, as I remember, is, he was also the, the leader of the team of the coffee stain effect. Um, right, so they developed, they developed this concept of, of diffusion limited aggregation in which uh, particles randomly will aggregate and will form patterns um, different patterns depending on, on different rules. And shortly after, after the, the, the work of, of, of Witten, uh, Thomas Wickshed and, and others like uh, um, family started to work on diffusion limited deposition models. You probably there in your institute uh, understand this much better than I do, uh, but just for the sake of clarity, I mean, let me, let me explain what I mean by, uh, by, by these deposition models. It's basically the idea that um, um, to try to find models that can reproduce um, uh, a film growth or an interface growth just using very simple rules, right? So the simplest model the, that, that we can think of is the random deposition model or, or Poissonian uh, model in which one particle, every particle falls, I mean, it appears randomly in, in different positions. And then it just falls in that in that column that uh, in which it randomly appears. If I build a film, uh, grow a film following like that, it will look like they like this. Particles appearing randomly in different in different regions and then growing growing like that. Um, and among many, I mean, we can the a way to characterize this type of growth is by measuring the 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 mean roughness, let's say, of the of the interface. It's basically uh, the average of the the standard deviation of the height, which I, I will call the roughness of this, and see how it evolves in time. And for example, in the case of the random deposition model, which is the simplest that I can think of, uh, it follows a scaling law with the average uh, height, or with in this case in time, uh, in which this beta will be zero point five. Very, very reproducible, very, very simple. Um, family and Bigshek studied also uh, um, the, another deposition model, which is also quite standard. Um, it's a deposition model in which a particle that is, for example, falling in this, in this column will stop not, not when it reaches the, 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 the bottom of its own column, but it will stop whenever they see another column another neighbor over here. So if there's another particle over here, it will stop over here. 
that will leave a lot of vacuum vacuums alone. I mean, in this in the, the case of the of the random deposition, everything is compact because everything falls in the same column. Here we'll have some correlation between some interaction with the neighbors, with the nearest neighbors around. Yeah. So um, in this, what typically was called the ballistic deposition model, the, um, the position looks like this, a little bit messy, leaving some vacuums here and there. And um, family and Dixie realize that actually this deposition model can, uh, or the roughness of this deposition model follows some dynamic scaling, which uh, for moderate values of the of time or the height, it follows some scaling with some some value of beta. In, in the case, it was around 0.3, and actually this roughness will saturate at large times or at lar large heights, following this type of scaling where L is uh, the the length the, of the of the of the system that I have, I have uh, on dimensional uh, system. And gamma and, uh, and beta are, are well known. Um, right, so we wanted to see if, if our system follows one of these or the other, uh, the Poissonian or the ballistic, they seem comparable, similar to both of them. Um, but we needed to do the simulations. Why? Because um, in these simple deposition models, the particle rate, the particle, the incoming particle rate is typically constant. You know? Particles come, it's always the same number of particles per unit time. In our case, we don't have that. Actually, our, our, we have a nonlinear uh, um, incoming particle rate. Typically, our, our, our d, n, dt is, is scaled like 1.5 or something like that. So we needed to rep repeat this type of deposition models in inserting our, our deposition rate. Uh, to make sure that we have the same, maybe find the same scaling laws or maybe find different ones. Maybe there is a way, there was a way to, to do this analytically, but uh, we wanted to be 100% sure. So we did just the simple, very simple simulations. Each curve that you see here is the roughness as a function of the, of the height, um, because as I, said, as I told you, the height also doesn't evolve linearly in time. It, it, it goes with non-linearly in time. In this case, we have a using a, a random deposition model. Um, I'm using here the blue line is just the um, constant incoming particle rate. You see that is it follows the the scaling law of 0 0.5 uh, for several decades, no problem. And I'm putting here actually in this uh, this rectangle over here the um, the experimental. This, the size of the my, the my experimental area. Yeah? So basically, I, I, I can only see this range of heights. And then when I put the, my nonlinear uh, incoming particle rate, I reach a saturation at some point. This saturation is because I'm, I'm increasing the number of particles per unit time so much at the end. After some time, I basically put in particles in all my columns. So the roughness doesn't change significantly. And when I do this for the, for the ballistic deposition model, I, I also reproduce more or less the same scale, uh, scalings. And interestingly, I even reached exactly the same saturation that, uh, that family and Dixit predict in their, in their dynamic scaling, right? So this is very good news. Things work even with a different deposition rate. So um, we could go and then compare with our, with our experiments. We took a lot of care with this. Um, we wanted to make sure, I mean, it's easy to be biased when you do some fitting of the data. You see that the data that we have is really noisy. Uh, each of these are, we have five experiments in each case. Ideally, we'll have more, but I mean, these experiments are complicated to do, so we didn't have so, so much data. What we did, it was basically a log logarithmic binning, and then the fitting is done using weights, and the weights are proportional to the number of particles per, per pin, just to be completely safe. The exponents that we got, I mean, we will expect, we had been hoping to have a transition from kind of a, a random deposition to a ballistic deposition. So we were expecting uh, exponents of around 0 0.5 and here's 0 0.3. Um, as you see, the exponents that we get point in that direction. So there's a clear change in trend from, the, from when we go to 50 millimolar, but Still, I will be very careful to say that we see a transition uh, from from a random deposition to a to a ballistic deposition. Um, I need to mention here that uh, 
we're not the first ones looking at this type of depositions in evaporating droplets. Uh, Juncker et al. also look at, at this type of deposition, not in a, in a different system than us. What they have is a water droplet with, with particles, colloids that were not spherical. And they, they, they claim in this experimental uh, paper that, uh, that they could see a transition from a, from a ballistic process for spheres uh, to a, which I mean, a ballistic deposition model follows a, a KP set, universality class to a quench KP set. So a little bit more complex uh, type of deposition model whenever we have ellipsoids which is basically dominated by, by lateral uh, correlations. Right? And this was nicely confirmed uh, by Cristoforo and, and Nuno and Margarita um, in a very beautiful paper uh, in which they, using their patchy particle model, particle model they, could, uh, they could actually confirm that it's actually possible to have this transition from the KPC to the quench KPC um, as you change the way the particles interact, uh, as if you assume that they are interacting in a completely different way. So still there are a lot of things that I don't understand from these type of systems, but uh, at least they confirm that this is possible in their, in their system. It's still a different case as, as us, but nice, nice that they have this comparison over there. Okay, time is running. I'm running a bit out of time. So I want to spend the last five minutes uh, or less um, just telling you a last one last case. Uh, well, I told you what happens when we have a pin contact line. This will be this case. I want to show you just briefly what happens if you don't have a pin contact line, right? If you don't have a pin contact line, your droplet will evaporate as you see here, just moving the contact line is able to move. In this case, we don't have any evaporation driven flow. Um, we just have the droplet shrinking, right? And we achieve that by, by putting our droplets in uh, super hydrophobic substrates. Right, and um, as you see, the job the, this contains the same type of colloids. The droplet evaporates, just shrinking the interface, and at some point it doesn't evaporate anymore. And we 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 saw that over there. When we look at this in the in the electronic um, uh, scanning ele uh, electronic microscope, well, you can see this is a top view. You see, I mean, this substrate is based based on uh, micro pillars, so the droplet is actually holding and being held there in, in these micropillars. All the colloids are actually clustered in a microscopic cluster, which has actually also a spherical shape. And I just showing you here that actually there, this microcluster is lying on these pillars. And I want you to take a look at the interface now. So, I mean, you know, the interface with well, the outer part of the, of the cluster. And you can see that there is actually made of patches of crystalline patches with different shapes. But I mean, within these patches, you have a very nice uh, hexagonal packing of the particles. And I want to just spend one minute showing you how, how does this happen? Um, because one can actually understand very well how, how these patches are being formed. So imagine we have, again, particles distributed randomly in this, in this volume. And, uh, and, and I'm going to make a really simple, really silly simulation, a 2D simulation particles uh, diffusing brand, uh, randomly. Uh, and this radius is going, to, I'm going to change it linearly in time. It's, in practice, it's not linear in time, but I'm going to just do it linearly in time. And I'm going to, I can define then the, the typical diffusive time scale of this particle, of these particles based on their size and on the diffusion constant. And then I can also define a typical time scale of the, of the shrinkage of, the, of my droplet, um, which, might change in time actually uh, because uh, because of the relationship, but um, I will um, in this simulation I'm going to put the typical values that we have of this ratio in the in experiments, which change from ten to the minus four to ten to the minus three. The ratio between these two, this means that the particle diffusivity is always a smallest time scale, so so the interface is always moving way way slower than the typical Brownian motion of the particle. It doesn't matter. Um, in which situation I'm, I'm branding diffusivity will always dominate. So what I typically always think in the in the literature is 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 that well the particle will be always homogeneously distributed because Brownian the Brownian time scale is a dominating one. 
I want to show you in this simple, very silly simulation that actually that's not the case. So if I let my system go, go around in the, under these conditions, you see that, yeah, the particles are moving faster, but the interface is just the confining volume is just shrinking and shrinking. And at the end of the day, I mean, the particles will just end up at the interface. The only condition that I'm putting in the, for the particles in these simulations is that the particles cannot go out. So I'm not trapping them at the interface. They're free to go from the interface. They just cannot go beyond. And still, they all end up at the interface. So in this silly simulation, I'm also not putting an interaction within the particles. But you can imagine if I have more particles in my system, um, they will start to interact with each other. And they will start to come together, making clusters, agglomerating, and making these patches that you have seen there before. And that happens only on the first layer, let's say, on the outer layer. If, you if I have many more particles in my system, not only I will make these patches, I will make actually shells. So, and the more, the, the more particles I make, the thicker the shell that I'm making. And depending on the amount of particles that I have in my system, these shells will have different, different shapes. And for example, if, if I don't put enough particles in my, in my system, the shells will be rather thin, and that makes them also very mechanically unstable. Such that my actually my my the cluster might actually crumble into what we call a buckle a buckle cluster, which is uh, basically this this that you have here. And what I'm changing over here in these three cases that I'm showing you here is just the concentration, the initial concentration of particles in a droplet. I will just in the just a couple of more minutes. I will just focus in the buckle cluster and the spheroid is in the next couple of slides. So as I increase the initial concentration of particles in my system, I can have, I can measure here the aspect ratio, basically the sphericity, um, the sphericity of my of my object, of the final object. And you can see that it's clearly, I mean, as I increase the initial concentration, I tend to go to end up in spheroids. But you see here that there is still here some, some buckle clusters over there, even at the maximum, at the maximum concentration. And this has to do with the time scale in which I evaporate my system. So if I evaporate my system using high humidity, this means a very slow process, I will end up with a more rigid, more solid uh, shell. And if I do it a little bit faster, around 60%, I will typically buckle a, li a little bit. Not much, just 10% um, of, of sphericity, but enough to see uh, an effect. So, um, right. So, Basically, that's everything that I wanted to tell you uh, today. I hope I convinced you that I have a, a couple of cases in the case of, of, of sessile droplets uh, with pin contact lines. One, the classical coffee stain effect in which we have close uh, streamlines. And then, then another one, uh, which is the case in which I have my flow dominated by Marangoni stresses, pin contact line as well. But um, in this case, everything dominated by the only streamline that goes towards the interface, which is the, which is the, the one in the, at the along the interface. And then finally, um, this case with the, when my system is actually, I don't have any, um, any contact line. I don't have also no flow. I only have the incoming interface, which actually is gathering my particles and putting there collecting them and dragging them along the interface, and then inducing um, aggregation uh, due to uh, increasing confinement of the droplet. Yeah? So I think these are a few cases that are very clear and very common because, I mean, we, we see them all the time. This will also occur, for example, for a droplet, any droplet evaporating in air, for example, uh, containing any type of non-volatile uh, non -volatile components. Okay, and just for ending, let me just uh, thank a little bit to the people that, that contributed, many more than the people that you, you, you see here. Uh, Hanneke Halelblom and Naomi Nandoven worked with me in the initial part with the coffee stain effects and the working. Uh, Stefan Kaprischka uh, in the salt. Uh, Massimiliano Rossi, uh, now in Copenhagen, is the guru that developed these uh, optical techniques. The artist, Maris Makers, my PhD students, uh, Mirte Brunin and Carola Seifer. Uh, that is still have been working with me in the at the University of Twente. And basically that's everything that I wanted to tell you today. And I'll be very happy to answer any question that you might have.
Okay, thanks very much, Alvaro, for a fascinating seminar. Questions? Ah, here we have a question from Nuno. Hi, Alvaro. Hello. Thank you very much for, for your talk, very clear as always. Uh, I have two questions. The first one is about the first part. So you always assume that the particles do not go to the interface. But from the energetical point of view, I would expect that they sit at the interface. And so uh, what is, why do you assume that they are always in the bulk and only being dragged by the flow? And uh, if you expect any differences, if they go to the interface and they sit at the interface. And the second part is about the experiments, this, this one from 2020, where, where you add salt into your drop. And the question is, isn't the interaction between the particles also being affected by the addition of salt? And that's it. Yeah, 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 the second is easier than the first one, but let me start mm -hmm. with the first one. Um, sure, I mean, it's, it's a really tricky question. I mean, how the particles interact with the interface? I mean, I'm, I've been focusing in this type of particles, um, which, I mean, the, these are polystyrene particles. They have some negative surface charge which makes them very hydrophilic. So if this polystyrene particle will be naked, it will typically be uh, more, much more easily absorbed at the interface. Um, it will have more affinity to lie at the interface. But I mean, because they have this surface group, they typically are better, um, better dissolved, more hydrophilic. Still, we also see, I mean, that the, uh, even in the, um, in the case of the classical coffee stain, we see them, they, they some particles, I mean, the ones that are typically more lying in the upper part, eventually they get trapped at the interface. I mean, we're not the only ones that have seen that. Um, and that will depend, that accumulation of particles will depend on the type of particles that you're using. So if I will use a different type of particle, actually, even in the classical coffee stain, I will have more accumulation of particles at the interface, right? Actually, there have been people, there have been some authors in the literature suggesting that actually is particle accumulation what drives the whole accumulation process. I don't think so because I mean you you seen for example in the first videos that you see a lot of particles coming from the bulk into into the into the contact line right but for sure I mean that a lot of the things that I have told you depend strongly on the type of particles that you have I mean even the case of of Juncker at all where they have uh, non coated uh, asymmetric particles these particles for different reasons I mean not only because of the type of surface that they have but also because of the shape they tend to uh, um, stabilize better at the interface than, than a spherical um, uh, functionalized particles, right? So a lot of these things will change uh, when, when you change the type of particle that you have. But at least the flows and the, and the, mechanism, and the main mechanisms uh, are as I told you. And I, I chose this particular type of particle because it has less tendency to aggregate at the interface. You know? So let's say to, to, to look into that. So I hope that, answer your, that answers your, your first question. Um, the second question, sure. I mean, the, we, I mean what, what we believe uh, is that the, it is the salt what changes the way the, 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 the salt changes the interaction, what changes the, what dominates the, this type of patterns. So on the one hand, you have the, the increase in velocity of the flow, but this increase in velocity is not significant enough to explain this, these patterns. So this, this, I mean, actually, I think I can conclude this directly. I mean, that this pattern is, core, is caused by the, inter, by, the, um, by the interaction of the particles with each other. Right? As you increase salt, you have less screening of this, uh, of this electrostatic repulsion uh, that this particle has. The particles start to get closer to each other, and then, um, and then they get, this, they get more, much more sticky right? in, in a lot of different random directions. So, and that's why I assume they get these, these shapes. We, all, we don't know in which positions are they are in the, at the interface. right? So you might have another degree of asymmetry if these particles are absorbed partially at the interface. You know, they will have a wetting, a non-homogeneous wetting, and that might lead also to some asymmetry, which will make them behave as asymmetric particles eventually. But we don't know that. It's, I'm just guessing, giving guesses here. I hope I answer. Yeah, thank you very much. Good, yeah. Right, we have a question from Margarita now. 
Oh, hello. Uh, let me put the, at least I've unmuted myself. Uh, Hi, Margarita. Thank you. Hi, Alvaro. Thank you very much for a very nice talk. And uh, one of my questions was already partially answered because uh, when you talk about salt and, and you know, uh, the sorting out effect, because the salt really will go, uh, will increase the surface tension, but the also, the, yeah, you have the competing effect of the particles trying to go to the interface because usually they, I mean, water air interface has a very high tension. So almost everything will absorb. So that probably depends very much on the size of the particles as well. I don't know, but I think, uh, I think you've already answered that. I think uh, the effects will probably be a combination of both. In your case, you seem to be saying that it's dominated by the salt concentration, but you also, I think, admitted that uh, you might get similar um, absorbing effects by changing the kinds of particles or by their size or their coating or whatever. So I think you've answered that, but uh, I'd like a comment on that as well. My second question is related to the uh, um, deposition rates and their time dependence. And of course, you, you get that information from the experiments and then you put it in the simulations. And what I really would like to know is, um, have you changed that uh, enough? I mean, do you know from the simulations up to, um, I mean, what sort of uh, time dependence and these non-constant deposition rates, uh, what sort of effects would they have on the um, roughening, which is what you're trying to measure? Mm -hmm. Is, is that a silly question or I mean, is it in no, 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 not at all, not at all. Let me, let me, although all the, in the first part of the question, I mean, although I kind of answer, um, is, is the effect of the salt on the aggregation of particles at the interface is, 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 is not trivial. I mean, at least not to me, because when we do experiments uh, with and without salt, uh, and we look at the, the amount of particles that aggregate at the interface, we see the amount, number of particles aggregating with and without salt. So, so that's that's something that we still, at least with this type of particles. Eh? I mean, I'm always talking about uh -huh. this type that are very highly hydrophilic particles eh? uh, with, with these sulfate groups. This for sure will change depending on the type of particles that, will, that you have. And the, com the, the, the problem becomes very complicated because it depends on the type of particle, the chemistry of the interface, the shape of the particles. Uh, so, yeah, but I mean, at, at least in this case, we know that that is is basically just a matter of of the motion of the interface which ends up ends up swapping around swapping along all the any other particle that is in the volume mm -hmm. um that's that effect is much more much stronger than any type of um diffusivity or or or, or chemical affinity or affinity of the particle to an interface because the, the motion of the interface is much faster than any other time scale that you can think of in that in that one, yeah. Um, that that regarding the the, the particle absorption of the interface, um, regarding the the uh, incoming particle rate, um, I mean, I don't have here the plots. I mean, they're they're in the in the paper. It turns out that the particles follow the um, follow this this uh, incoming particle rate, which I mean, in our case, it was approximately. Um, I mean, here's the total amount of particles, no? I mean, the incoming rate is the derivative of that. They follow that, that scaling law with time pretty well, very, very nicely. And these simulations that are run here are, are, uh, are run with this income, different incoming rate. And that was the first question that we had. I mean, do we reproduce the same uh, scaling? So at least these simulations are run with um, 100 simulations. This is the average of 100. And this is the results that we have. And this is with this, also the ballistic case eh, is with this incoming rate. Um, I was surprised also myself that we reproduce basically the same ones. Um, I, I hope you could you could answer me why why yeah, is that? Why it doesn't depend so much? Maybe maybe again, it's just a question of time scale, which on wins, you know, or, or if you make these yeah. rates uh, very different from what you've seen in the experiments, but it probably has to do with separation of time scales. I don't know, but I was I was surprised. Yeah, I, I was also surprised. I mean, the only effect that we see on the on the nonlinear uh, you know, particle rate is the saturation of the random of the random process. Eh? Yeah, but that's that's kind of easy to understand, right? Yeah, but I'm surprised you get such clean and and you know the same sort of. Uh, but maybe maybe these time scales are just very different. I don't know. I uh, I haven't thought about it. Yeah. Yeah. 
I mean, yeah, I have thought a lot about it, but I still, <laughs> I, still I don't know why. But a, the, 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 the fact is that they work. In the simulation, maybe you could really fiddle with these uh, uh, deposition rates so much to change the exponents or to say that they don't change at all. I mean, I don't no. know. Is, is it possible to think that if you change these uh, uh, non non constant time um, well deposition? Right. Do, do, can, can haven't, you... We haven't played enough. Maybe maybe you when you change the, the this rate. I mean, we, because I mean we don't in our case it only changes slightly. No, it maybe yeah. if you use a scale a much a stronger dependence with time, maybe maybe you see an effect then. As a earlier saturation, for example, in the ballistic case, probably you will find that. But we only we restrict ourselves to the case that we see in experiments right yeah but it doesn't seem to change the exponent anyway yeah i'm, I'm slightly surprised or, in this know, in this in the with the incoming yeah. particle rays that we have not no no no. Okay. thank you but um interesting yeah. question yeah good that's my idea yeah. Paulo, you're muted, yeah. Paulo, well, you're muted. I'm sorry. I was asking, is, are there any more questions? I see a question from Nuno. Yeah, I do have. OK, so just a comment about what you were discussing with Margarita. I, I don't really understand why, in the case of the simulations, uh, the, if you if you plot the, the roughness as a function of the number of particles or average height, that is typically what people use, then you get rid of the rate because it's a particle based. So I don't understand why you should see any differences when you change the rate even in the simulations, provided that you have uh, a dependence only on the, so, so provided that you have uh, uh, one particle at a time. So, uh, when you look to the roughness and the roughness exponent should not depend on the on the, on the rate the only thing that should depend on the rate and this because of the way you define time is 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 z so the kinetic exponent but not the roughness exponent because that is it's just what happens at this at saturation so yeah i know what i mean you're saying that they, these funny dependence on the deposition rate will just go into some dependence on how h grows with time Exactly, exactly. So typically the stress is to plot there's a function of the height. You find it away when you plot everything in terms of h, but there is a time dependence there, unless there is Yes, a yeah, 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 but is a, what I'm saying is that the kind of artificial one just because no, you I are playing with time. The way h grows with time would be different depending on the rates, but then the way the roughness depends on h. Exactly, it should be the same. And, it and should be the same, yeah. And until you mix up these scales, if you start mixing up these scales, it, it's actually exactly. Then, then you cannot no, no longer assume a, a separation of time scales, and then things yeah. get a bit messy. But, but yeah. yeah. Okay. 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 I also have another question now about the third part. This is really cool. The final result that you, that you showed to us. And uh, my question there is, if you play with the, with evaporation rate, what you are doing is basically playing with the domain with the the size of the domains of the order of structures, right? And the speed of the of the uh, how the confinement change, yeah. Mm. Yes. So so yes, if you if if you if you if you confine it in a very slow manner, then you expect to have larger and larger domains. Obviously, we know that in a sphere you, see, you need to have a certain number of defects. Uh, but my my point is, can you somehow? play with or control the shape of the bucklet structure by playing with the, the parameter space, so in particular, the evaporation rate and things like this. What I'm saying is, if you do it in a very slow manner, so I expect that you'll get larger and larger order domains. Yeah. And eventually, your buckling structure will not be a buckling structure, but rather a soccer ball kind of structure, for example, because you need to have these 12 defects and things like this. Have you played with that, or are you planning to, to make any trials? In so that um, the thing is that when we have, I mean, here we have a lot of particles. No, I mean, you have up to, uh, I mean, millions and, and, and uh, of particles. Um, I know, for example, people that have done similar experiments with emulsions, when 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 you can have smaller droplets, 
and a smaller number of particles, then you can have very well defined uh, geometrical uh, spheres. Um, mm -hmm. So I'm thinking of uh, Nicolas Vogel, Vogel in Erlangen, for example. They have uh, done that with just, I mean, a few thousands of particles in a, in a tiny droplet, evaporating very, very, even more slowly, much more slowly than we have here. And then they have achieved like very nicely geometrical, very nice order, much, much better, much better order. Uh, in our case, we have, I think it's just a matter that we have way too many particles. Our system is too large to have just a perfect, a perfect soccer ball. Uh, so we have, therefore we have these, these different uh, patches we have, uh, as asymmetric, uh, asymmetric shape. But yes, I mean, in principle, it should work as you slower it goes. And here you see a hint in this, in, here you, hear, you see a hint of this, no? Uh, larger uh, evaporation rates means uh, a slower, a slower evaporation. And this is the case where you get more sphericity. We haven't looked at the, at the size of the patches of the crystalline patches, but probably the crystalline patches will be larger in these cases. And this for the same particle concentration, if you, if you do it faster, you get a buckle, a buckle uh, cluster, which also will have smaller, uh, smaller crystalline patches at the interface. Right? So, but for the rest, I mean, it, it doesn't, the, 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 this time scale doesn't seem to matter at all. Only for the cases of higher, um, higher, uh, higher concentration of particles. When you have too few, I think it's everything is rather dominated by the thickness of the shell rather than by the, rather than by the, the ordering within the shell. So basically you can say that this is dominated by the ordering within the shell and this by the thickness. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and the buckling is through a buckling instability or the deformation is something that you see occurring over time in a very slow yeah. manner? It happens only in the last, in the last instance. Uh, of evaporation. So what we're guessing, because I mean, we haven't seen that uh, clearly, it happens basically when, if you have, let me clean uh, this thing. It basically happens with the, well, when if you have particles over that are you know, at the interface like that, our guess at least is that it happens when basically you have this menisci of water receding you know, when it's evaporating. Basically it's when the, that those interfaces start to dry out then they need to, they change, uh, they compact a little bit more and this causes stresses in the shell and then this is what causes the, the buckling. So it's really in the last instance when this uh, water is basically drying along the, along the shell, this, this interface is receding. That's typically what, what, you, what you, we would expect. But we haven't seen that literally, it's just a guess. So, but it, with the Thank time, you. it fits with the time scales in which we see the phenomenon. Yeah. Thank you very much. Yeah. Okay, thanks everybody. I don't see any more raised can, hands. Paolo, maybe I can ask one question. Okay, just one quick question from me for now. Sure. Uh, thank you, Alvaro, for a very interesting talk. Just one question. What about ellipsoidal colloid at surface of droplet? Do you expect some interesting liquid crystalline phases at interface? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I mean, this is exactly the case that uh, I didn't study that, but I mean, this is the case of Juncker and 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 uh, Yod and and all that, and the, the, this is the case that I mentioned before, that um, Margarita and Nuno and, and Cristovo, I mean, uh, studied with their Apache uh, system. So in the case they have pure water, or I think it's pure pure water, but uh, I'm not completely sure according to the paper. Um, and then they, they change the ellipticity of their of the particles that they use from a sphere to mild ellipsoidal shapes to very elongated ellipsoidal shapes. And then they saw completely different type of arrangements. Um, so instead of having, uh, um, yeah, very intricate and, and uh, shapes as, as you increase the ellipsoidal shape. So this, this, this is the case of the study. Is that what you, what you mean, uh, Nicola? Actually, at interfaces, the last part of your talk, those shells, shells formed by ellipsoids, not by spheres. Ah, you mean in the last part, I see. Um, good question. Um, yeah, that will be interesting because, I mean, we have no idea um, how they will interact. Yeah, uh, we haven't thought about it. Yeah, it will be uh, like a three-dimensional version of this, of this particular case. 
Uh, no, yeah, good. Um, thanks for giving me more work, Nicola, because I mean that will be very challenging also to to analyze. Okay, okay. Yeah. The problem there, I mean, is is uh, the the problem there in that type of system in these three dimensional systems is that um, to see what happens inside, no, because everything in these particles make the whole system opaque, and uh, that makes it really difficult to see how is the ordering inside. So it's, it's experimental; it's very challenging. But yeah, we'll, we could we could take a look at that. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Okay, so if there are no more questions, we already had a very lively discussion. So let's thank Alvaro again for a fascinating talk. Thanks everybody for coming. Thanks for having uh, me. Next week is Easter week, so there will be no seminar. We'll be back the week after that. So thanks everybody and see you then. Recording stops now. Okay, bye.